Good evening. Welcome to SW6 Essential, Joe Sansom. Um, I, I would like to think this is the most important video we've made all season. Yeah, I don't even think we're going to talk about Fulham today. To be honest, I think some matters are slightly more important than that. Yeah, football it's been, as a whole. Yeah. It's, it's been a quiet week, hasn't it, in terms of football stuff. Um, today's title, Super League 1, Fulham 1. Um, and actually, we're not going to talk about Fulham today. We're not playing at the weekend. We don't want to talk about a heartbreaking drop two points on Sunday. Uh, and thank God we have this to distract us of what came out on Sunday. Joe Sansom, let's let's kick off with what happened on Sunday. Um, nothing was apparent when Eddie Inketia, Eddie, Eddie in horse tranquilizer Tia, put the ball into the back of the net to make it 1-1. And then we watched, or what was it, Villa Burnley versus Manchester United. United yeah. Uh, and, and suddenly some, some things were coming out. Yeah, so to be honest, I went on my phone just before the Arsenal match started and I saw a couple of tweets from, um, I think it was Martin Ziegler, who I believe is from the Times, quite reliable, normally one of the first guys with you know football-related news. Um, and I saw a tweet um, about the Super League and my initial reaction was that they, they say this mo most years, they said this at the end of 2020, I believe, with Project Big Picture was almost this sort mm, of mm. narrative. And as I told you last week, I'm at my girlfriend's house, Arsenal fans, I told them uh, just before the match started, I was like, oh, there's this news again. And they were just like, oh, you know, here we go again. But none of us really believed it. Mm. I, I definitely didn't believe it. And then Arsenal match happened. I was fuming, not going to talk about it. Turn my phone off. I went for a walk and I came back and so what a mess. What a mm. mess. And, you know, I know that we both feel very strongly about this, but we basically had six rich families of six rich English clubs try and take the game that we love away from us, try and take the distraction that we have from normal life every week away from us for the sake of the lining of their pockets. And luckily, we've made this video now. We debated making it earlier a couple of times this week when it looked like the Super League was happening. It looked like the, 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 the Super Six, if you will, not just Jeff Stelling's game on a Saturday, but now the Super League Six um, <laughs> had actually fled and that was it. They'd signed binding contracts. That was it. Um, we debated making it earlier in the week when it looked like that was happening. Now they've all they've all been cowards. They've all gone. And whilst this is, of course, better than the alternative, I want to make it very clear that me and Jack are both on the same page. Absolutely none of these clubs are heroes. None of them have saved football. In fact, they tried to ruin it. Completely correct, honestly. Um, it was so weird and extraordinary how much this accelerated from 4.30 Monday, uh, Sunday to the evening. Sunday evening and Monday especially felt like deadline day. It felt yeah. bizarre. It felt like I was on Twitter probably all day. Yeah, all don't check day. your screen time. Do not check your screen time yeah, on Monday. Yeah, that screen time is going to be <laughs> horrendous when it comes through on, on Monday morning. It was so weird. And we debated doing a live stream. We thought this is yeah. so big that we could pop on the live stream for an hour and a bit and get some Q&A going and some discussion going with the fans or the viewers. Um, oh, it just it was extraordinary. Uh, and this, you know, rest in peace football. Everyone was like, that's it, football's done. And really what it comes down to is, um, like you said, six families from the Premier League have no understanding of the game, no understanding of what it means to us as fans. And, and honestly... Um, you know, there were very few people who were for the Super League. And I thought, it's not a good idea. But genuinely, for our sakes, for Fulham's sake, I thought it's not the worst thing in the world. And maybe that was too rational. But I thought if the top six go and do their own thing, get eradicated from the Premier League, I think that makes things so much more exciting. Because, I mean, I've, if, you, if you watched 18-19 myself personally, and a lot of people felt going to top six games, playing the top six, hosting them, I mean, the Liverpool fans in our end, Man City fans in our end, going to top six, getting forced to sit down at Anfield when we lost 2-0 when Mitrich scored an onside goal 
and then Mo Salah scored a goal that shouldn't have counted because the ball was rolling. Like these experiences last season, sorry, season before, horrible. I hate playing the top six, um, especially going to the games. Um, so I, for me, I didn't mind. I didn't mind. But of course, the overall um, feeling from everyone was that this is just ridiculous, selfish, uh, uh, just unbelievably obnoxious. Uh, and and what we saw was fantastic. Jamie Carragher, Gary Neville, just give them statues outside Buckingham Palace. Like genuinely so good. Such passion. I almost thought Neville was going to cry on TV, which would have been <laughs> unbelievable. Uh, and, and massive credit to Dave Jones as well, who did a remarkable job of just keeping the conversation going, not letting it get too much. Yeah, fantastic, Joe. And uh, what we saw now is that it's been lifted. It's not going to happen. But there has to be repercussions. The Premier League cannot just let them walk all over us. They have to have a backbone. This is what I'm worried about because, you know, the big six offer financially an unbelievable amount of value to the Premier League. We know that TV rights, the big six games, maybe they're not the easiest on the eye sometimes, the same way that maybe uh, Fulham versus Burnley may not be the most easy on the eye at times. You know, sometimes there's a thriller, sometimes there's not. But the TV rights for those games are unbelievable value. You get viewers from all over the world. You've got fans all over the world for these teams. And that that is the main part of their product. Um, I understand that they're probably, they're just going to be so nervous right now on what to do. But the main point is, and I know we're both very aligned on this, there has to be punishment because we've seen punishment for a lot less from a lot smaller clubs that couldn't deal with the repercussions. We've seen Wigan get relegated last year um, due to financial reasons. That's in the Championship. We've had teams relegated from the Premier League due to points deductions, such as Middlesbrough in the past. We've had so many occasions of points deductions over the years for basically minor things compared to this. Just not dealing with your money properly, transfer dealings. These teams tried to leave for good. I know that they're arguing that, no, we wanted to stay in English football. We would play the Premier League games on the weekend as usual and we play the Super League games uh, midweek. Um, that can't work because all these teams are getting billions of pounds um, to build their squads. Their second teams would be better than everyone else's, and they just put those second teams out on the weekend. Who cares if we beat Fulham? We've qualified for the equivalent of the Champions League anyway. Um, mm. So there has to be repercussions because these teams try to rip apart English football. Perez can stop talking absolute horse shite in terms oh, yeah. of the, the fact that the value would go all the way down the football pyramid. That's simply not true. I don't see how Tranmere Rovers are going to benefit from a Super League because it's a closed league. You know, there's five teams that are invited as guests. How lucky are they, by the way? I'd love to be a guest team, said absolutely no one ever. Um, and then, so... so I'm almost lost for words. I almost can't get my trail of thought because I'm so annoyed at this situation and I'm annoyed at a lot of things. Um, I'm annoyed at the fact that they went behind everyone's back and have been playing this for years mm. and then think a simple apology can do. Mm. And they they probably think they can get away with it. We've seen all 14 other clubs, including Fulham, were strongly against it, as you'd expect. They need to be pushing now for a punishment. I don't just want a fine because a fine will not hurt these teams. Then, Do you think a fine is going to hurt the Glazers or FSG? Mm. They're absolutely minted. They just want more money on top of it. So the only way to hurt them is through the clubs themselves and the positions of those clubs, the league those clubs are in, sanctions, European football. Are they banned for the next few years? I think they should be. Things like this. And I don't know the actual answer myself. From a Fulham perspective, obviously, you know, you never know what could happen with points deductions. Could we stay up? To be completely honest, I don't care long term in terms of English football about Fulham as long as this situation gets resolved. I don't care if there's a point deduction now or next year. Personally, mm. obviously, it'd okay. be amazing. Like, it would be amazing if like Fulham stayed up as a result of this and these teams got punished. But that's not the be all and end all for me. The be all and end all for me is that these teams get punished enough that they won't do this again. 
because what I heard from these statements and these videos and these groveling apologies, it didn't really mean much to me. I think they cut through quite, cut quite thin. Um, I think that they need to be told that this cannot happen again. Um, and if you do this again, then you're out of the league. I mean, would it be wrong for them to be out of the league now? Possibly well, purely because of the effects on English football. The argument is, have they broken a rule? Now, yeah. to hand, I don't have the rules up. I have read them several yeah. times, though. And it's something like if you join, not join, but if you partake in a competition without the Premier League's consent or something like that. And what they have done, and the argument is, they haven't joined, sorry, they haven't partaken because there's been no games. Okay, fine. But they they either verbally agreed or signed some sort of contract. Yeah. And that, for me, the intent, the intent to leave, not leave, but but to have this Super League and still want to play domestic football, like that, for me, the Premier League have to come down on them like a ton of bricks, regardless of the fact that they've withdrawn. You know, actually, to be fair, the fact that they've withdrawn so quickly, for me, fi- I'm fearful now. The Premier League will be like, oh, okay, okay, they've made a mistake. And they've, they've, yeah, exactly. No, no. The intention was there from all six. And this whole thing about, oh, Manchester City and Chelsea, um, they weren't really into it, but they kind of just went along with it. So what they all they all they all signed the contract or i don't know they they agreed and that for me is unforgivable we have Um, seen clubs say no it wasn't impossible for them to Mm. say no i don't buy this missing the boat bollocks at all Mm. it's quite simple do you want to sign up to this super league yes or no they said yes Mm. they gave up if i'm a top six fan now Big Six fan, is they're not the top six currently at all. Um, mm. If I'm a Big Six fan, I am so angry at my club. Mm. I feel so betrayed. I know it's not the players. I know it's not the manager. It's probably not even some people that are higher than them. But it's the very, very top, the owners that don't come and watch the games. The people that we've seen reports don't even know what colour their teams are playing in. I know that Sky said oh, one yeah. owner right. did. Um if these are the people that that, 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 that that could not care less about the fans and I would feel so betrayed by my club. And I'm very relieved that we're not in a position where um, we would ever be considered for something like that. I mean, I would hope that Shahid Khan would say no anyway, but I'm very glad that we're not in a position like that because I would feel so differently towards my club that they gave up everything for some money. And if it wasn't for this reaction... They'd be there now. They'd be yeah, they'd, planning it still. Yeah, they'd be. They'd be like, "This is great," and, and the outrage and the passion from the English fans um, is to be commended. Now, Chelsea fans, you did not save football. I am sorry. You went down and you protested like Liverpool fans did and like Leeds fans did. It just so happened to be Petr Cech that came out and, and had a little conversation with you. You did not save football. The reaction of the whole footballing world, especially in England, was the reason why this was um, withdrawn. Um, fair play to all the Chelsea fans. I know my friend Ian, yeah, he went yeah. down and did it. Yeah, fair play. Um, I, I would have done the same. We were even talking in our group chat when we played Chelsea and this is still going on. We should go down and protest. And we were all for that. But Chelsea, <laughs> Chelsea fans did not save football. They are still a club that has been accused of racism to Raheem Sterling. Didn't let that guy on the train in Paris have had numerous of terrible things um, against them. Just a fan base that I will not ever look at and go class, top class, because of the things they've done in the past. And I'm sorry, that is just the truth. Um, This argument from Fulham fans about would Shahid have signed up if we were given the opportunity? And they say yes, because, you know, he's an NFL, he's... this whole NFL system that they keep comparing it to, he's the owner of Jacksonville Jaguars. Of course he'd be onside. I disagree, uh, Joe. I don't know what you think, but I think Shade Khan has got a lot of respect for the fans. And we've seen so many over the years, classy uh, statements being put out by him. I don't believe for one second that he'd be on board of it um, just because the heritage of the club, um, where we've come from. I mean, even Chelsea. I mean, you've come, you had... Nothing up until Abramovich came in. City as well. Nothing up until 
um, the takeover in 2007, 2008. Um, I, I don't believe for one minute that Shade Khan would go, yeah, we'll be up for that because there is, there's no chance that we would take it and, and then there would be real problems with Shahid Khan. And thank God, obviously, we're not in that position. Uh, I think Shahid Khan is a fantastic owner. Joe, I don't know I don't know what you think. Yeah, I, I've got to say, when I, when I saw those tweets, I, I wasn't 100% sold myself whether mm. um, he would just sell Fulham's soul. Um, of, I, I don't know if I can say with 100% certainty like you can, purely because of the NFL closed model sort mm. of format of the league. I know that that appeals to a lot of people, but I don't think of Shahid Khan like any of these other owners in completely disassociated from the club. I don't think of him like a Stan Kroenke that doesn't even go to the games, doesn't care, FSG. I really mm. don't think any of these guys care. The Glazers, could they care less what happens to Manchester United? I think Shahid Khan cares. Um, yeah. And so that, I think, for me is a difference. And I would very much hope that he would have turned it down. Um I think that the reason that a lot of people are saying this is because most of these people, Bruce Buck, all the people I've just mentioned are American. And mm. because of the NFL style thing, as I just said, of the closed league, no relegations, just glory. Um, but there's no merit in that glory if you haven't qualified for it. So I understand why people have made the claims. I understand that people were almost looking for a link to Fulham and thinking, well, how can we be involved in this? What, what would we have done? Um, the truth is we don't know. And none of the other clubs know. I know we've all come out and we've all said this is awful. But the people that are at the very top of all these football clubs, all the 92 clubs in the country, these won't be the only six that would have said yes by any stretch of the imagination if they got the chance. Um, and that is the more worrying thing. And this is why I think that the next point we should come on to should be uh, fan ownership of clubs and mm. the government trying to force through um um, something to make it uh, 50 plus one, the 50 plus one um, situation that we've seen in Germany where clubs have a fan owned or at least part of it model, which means that these um, huge American or whatever corporations can come in and change the club completely because 51% is fan owned, which mm. means that they can vote against these measures. And I think that that is something very important. And I think that that is even more important than the punishment of the six clubs because I think that that will change how these businessmen at the top of clubs think and how they can completely disregard fans. I was reading just now and I was hearing from um, my girlfriend's brother, who's an Arsenal fan, that there was a Q&A with Arsenal fans today with the son of Stan Kroenke. Joe Kroenke, came, yeah. Yeah, he, he, he sent his son along instead of himself, which is obviously a big man fronting up to all his problems, as usual. Um and I don't think there was an apology at all. These people will not get it. These people will still not get it. They'll apologise or say all that. Behind your back, they're thinking, OK, they didn't get this Super League, but how can we make Super League version two? Mm. Maybe we need a second division. Maybe we need to invite more teams. Maybe we need more money. That's what they'll be thinking right now. So before they come up with another counter proposal, they need to change the modelling of ownership in UK football. Yeah, completely. Um your your point about other owners, uh, sorry, yeah, other owners from non top six clubs or big six clubs agreeing to this. I think you could only assume that if you ask the fan base, um, yeah, because the fan base of that club will have their opinion on their owner. As a, we have our opinion on Shade Khan, Tony Khan, Tony, Tony Khan, not really the owner, he's the owner's son. Um, the 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 one club that sprung to mind when you said other other clubs might join is West Ham. Yeah, but I don't know that for sure. I would have to ask my friend Joe, who supports West Ham or any West Ham fan, um, because they know their owners better than obviously we can make assumptions for. Um, but fifty plus one for me is great because it gives yeah. ownership to the fans, and it it just seems more healthy. And and what comes with that, and what has been a huge part of the conversation um, the last couple of days, is that you look at the German model: cheap tickets, cheap season tickets. Um, full stadiums all the time, and you just have the impression that if the fans had an ownership in the clubs, especially the top clubs in the Premier League and Championship, that we'd see ticket prices come right down, and there'd be some implementations with travel. Uh, I saw like free travel with a with a match day ticket, which I mean would be unbelievable because right now football is very very expensive. I mean, we, we've been lucky, sort of, that we won't be, can't go to games in this climate. 
obviously we can't but but it would be very expensive i mean you know every season i, I spend at least over a thousand pounds before food and drink on on a, on a, on match day so what sort of things would you like to see come in if that was 50 plus one if that came into the question or the picture in english football I would hope that that would start to make football, as you say, more affordable, both for fans and for clubs. Um, I think the competition has got so steep now in terms of the difference between what clubs can compete with each other in terms of transfer prices. And I would hope that that would start to have an impact and make the market slightly less just extortionate, to be honest with you. Um, You know, the Super League would have only made that worse. There's a, there's a there's an advert that came out around the time of the 2014 World Cup, um, okay. and it was about perfect football. I, you might remember it, and it was all to do with these this guy that came in, um, and he created almost these. There is a point to this, by the way. Okay. These like football um, soldiers that were perfect at football. Every shot they made would go in the top corner. Every pass they made was absolutely perfect, and people got bored with normal football, and this Super League thing really reminded me of that advert. I saw a few oh, yeah. people almost make a comparison. And I think the football has gone this way in general. VAR, the way they've implemented it is trying to be perfect. Football is not a perfect game. And that's not the way it was intended to be. Mm. Um, the way that the best players are hundreds of millions of pounds. It's so it's getting to a stage where the difference between the top and the bottom is so large that it's completely unsustainable. The richer clubs are getting richer. And eventually the poorer clubs will go out of business mm. and then we'll have a super league with just the teams that are left standing. Mm. And so this is what I'd like to see with the 50 plus one model, sustainable um, funding in terms of, I want every club to be able to survive mm. TV rights more evenly split out. If that's possible, mm. transfer prices starting to deflate slightly. Obviously the best players will be the most expensive, but come on, do you really think that some of these players are worthy of, Harry Maguire, what eighty million pounds, something like that. This, this that, that that's not what should Yalk, be happening. Yoki Manderson, Yoki Manderson, two hundred million. Well, that's another yeah. question. <laughs> uh, um, and yeah, uh, just ticket prices for us fans should be lower. I know that there's been a few comparisons money wise this year because we should remember Super League clubs are not the only bad guys in football. UEFA, in my eyes, are also very much the bad guys. Sky, in my eyes, also very much the bad guys. Yeah, and that was they were charging us. They were charging us fifteen quid this season. No, uh, hold on, hold on. Yeah. That's a Premier League decision, and that was that was from Sky and BT. Sky and BT did not say right. We're going to charge. It was the Premier League that came in. Fair enough. And said so. We can't blame them on that. But what we can blame them yeah. on is, I mean, that they're extortionate subscription monthly subscription prices yeah i know now we should remember as well that they asked they asked the premier league for a because i completely agree with you that's spot on that's my mistake that's okay they asked the premier league for a reduction in the prices of the football games that they're purchasing to then charge us for okay um due to the fact that the product wasn't the same behind closed doors which is which is true Mm. um there was no change to the subscription price for us fans at all, even though they were getting it for cheaper, there was never even a question of that. Um, and it shouldn't be gone. It shouldn't go unnoticed that Sky, um, when this was going on a few days ago, and it was almost at its peak, the Super League, you could suddenly view Sky Sports videos from anywhere in the world. It was free to view on YouTube. Super League's no longer a thing. That's no longer possible instantly because it's all about making sure that the game stays as they want it to stay, which is Sky are the top dogs. We show the big games. We know what the big games are. It's the top six, even if they're not in the top six. And sadly, I just think there's so many bad guys in football and this has only heightened that. You're right. And that was exactly my next point. This week has been a major wake-up call for football. Ed Woodward, resigning at the end of the year fantastic news for Manchester United fans and I tell you what if we get uh, an FSG a Kronke out this uh, a Glazer a Levy whoever this will be the like the because they've been wanting that for ages you look at Manchester United tweets sometimes and you scroll down the comments and it's just Glazer out Glazer out Glazer out and if they were to leave or sell up it'd be the best thing to happen and obviously, there should be repercussions. We'll come on to that again 
the repercussions of, of what's happened for the six clubs. Um, but if they were to go and, and their club would become better because of it, because they wanted them out for so for such a long time, fantastic. I mean, we've lo- Arsenal have wanted Kronke out for so long. Ivan Gazidis left a few years ago. That was fantastic. They were very happy. Kronke, and, and I've actually just seen a notification come on my laptop a couple of minutes ago, that the Kronke reaction to the Kronke q and I'm, I'm quite interested to watch that after we finish up here. Joe, next point. Uh, a lot of people on Twitter winding me up by saying, don't punish the top six because it's, what about the players and the fans? It's not their fault. Please do your research. Literally less than 12 months ago, as you said, Wigan Athletic enter administration, which is horrible. The worst thing to happen in football. And they deducted 12 points. And we ourselves, Fulham FC, send them into League One. And now they look like they're just about going to survive under the new ownership in League One. Fantastic news. Birmingham City, uh, transfer embargo, deducted points, I think a couple of years ago, stayed up, happy days. You have to get out of your heads that EFL will go straight after the guys, doesn't matter about the fans, they'll st- go straight after them for selling their stadium to themselves, Chancery, Pride Park, Derby County, uh, what's his face, can't remember his name. You have to, have to punish the top six, reg- regardless of the players, regardless of the fans, because it's happened all over football, and again, it would just be, it would just be this favoritism to the top six if they go unpunished. Yeah, one hundred percent. And it, I'm actually sure that a lot of people um, are split on this, but I'm also very sure that a lot of top six fans will will agree with this completely and think, you know what, this isn't right. And if we don't don't get the correct punishments, then something like this will only happen again in a couple of years, in a couple of months, whenever. Um, I think that most top six fans that are honest would say, would say their opinion of their club has changed after this and it's not going to be instantly repaired. But you're completely right in that you say that a lot of smaller things have gone punished far more severely um, than something like this may be punished for. And that's unforgivable. This should They should throw the book at these clubs because if these clubs got their way, if let's say we all reacted and we said, OK, fine, you join your Super League, they would be gone. They do yeah. not care about any of the repercussions of English football. If the reaction wasn't this bad, they would have gone. If it was even half as bad, they wouldn't be here. Um, and you can't almost forgive that because this is what not punishing them would be. It would be instant forgiving them, instantly forgiving them. They've got their places back in Europe as the the, the top clubs, even though half of them are mid-table. Um it's just that there has to be punishment. If there's not punishment, then I expect similar protests to the other day because it's unfair. Even if it's not a points deduction, just say you're not allowed into Europe. All this top four chasing it goes for nothing because I don't think they deserve to be in Europe next season. They tried to leave it. They tried to leave it. They didn't want to be in the Champions League next season, so let's go. They're not in it then. Even Manchester City last season, they had a threat. In fact, they got given two-year European ban. Um, I can't remember what it was. It I can't remember what it was for now, but it was uh, something. I think overspent. You know, I don't know. Uh, and they appealed it. Oh no! Welcome back. You appealed it. Yeah, come back in. And now they're in a the semi-final. And I, I hope City. Well, I, I hoped City would win the Champions League. Now it should be PSG. Now PSG should win the Champions League based on just what's gone on. Uh, and and this is where I stand. I think. Yeah. I think they should be PSG should win the Champions League now and then they kick out everyone in the european league uh, europa league so it'll be a villarreal versus roma final so arsenal and united are gone from the europa league i think and this is not bias i think because of what happens with wigan last season they should immediately be given points deductions immediately and of course you're going to say oh yeah because fulham will stay up blah 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 blah, blah. even if we even if they give it a 20 Point deduction. We're one point above Arsenal. We're four. We're four or five games to go. Five games to go. And also, also by the way, even if yeah, it's yeah. a smaller, even if it's a smaller deduction than that, I, I would, I would take it from a mm. non film perspective, just, just because I think there should be a, a principle, yeah, a, a punishment of that size. Mm. Even if it was like you deduct, I don't know. Like, I don't, I'm not looking at the table right now, but let's say like, I don't know five points, something like that. I don't think that'd be good enough, but no. it's something, and I'm sure that would change the situation for a lot of clubs and humble them quite a lot. Mm. 
Um, but it should be more than that. It should be way more than five. I think it should be between 20 and 30. And mm. I, I, could, I could just picture the comments already. People type in, you just saying that because you support Fulham. Of course. I would love Fulham to be in the Premier League next season. Why? Because if you keep Yalke Manderson, Ariola, Lookman, and add to this amazing, not amazing squad, because again, your squad's not amazing, you're 18th. Add to this squad that I feel has got bags of potential. Bags of potential for stay up. Um, 30 point deduction, min, uh, I don't know, 20 to 30, and a three year ban on Europa League and Champions League football. I, I don't know if you agree. I agree with something of that strength. Yeah, for sure. I don't know what it will be, but these clubs completely, completely left everyone else in the mud. They yeah. tried to, they knew that it was going to change English football forever, and they went through with it anyway. They all came out with very strange announcements all at the same time. They went behind everyone's backs. And I think that there should be a very strong punishment. It's, of course, for the, for the fans, I feel sorry for them. For the genuine top six fans, I feel very sorry for them. Because if this is my club, I, I, wouldn't wish this, I wouldn't wish that on anyone. I wouldn't wish that on any club at all, including Chelsea. You know, I don't like Chelsea. I wouldn't wish that on their fans. Because wow. there is genuine people there that's <laughs> there's genuine people there that support their club, that love their club, and they've done nothing wrong here. But Wigan did nothing wrong last year. Chef Wednesday fans did nothing wrong this year. For the whole of time, none of these fans have actually done anything physically wrong, and they've been punished because their club has done wrong, and it should be exactly the same here. Yeah, because that that is consistency and it's transparency. Trans- transparency, yeah. Yeah. Um, I mean, I keep thinking about Wigan, but there are so many more clubs, even at lower league level. Um, there was a whole list. I remember, uh, I remember reading Bournemouth were given a points deduction, and that was when they were all the way in League Two, yeah. um, and they almost got relegated to the Conference. I think they were given a points deduction and still stayed up into League Two, and then look at the rise they've gone on now. And somehow Jonathan Woodgate might be a Premier League manager next season. Um, they're on fantastic form, Bournemouth. Um, I really hope they get back in the Premier League. Um, well, uh, Barnsley, I'd rather Barnsley. Oh, we'll, uh, this is this is yeah. for another day. Um, Joe, we've covered basically everything, but there's still a lot yeah. to talk about. Just because it's just like, I just feel very sad. And I think everyone feels very sad that people feel they have the, entit- the entitlement to take football away like you said, but the top six fans, you've got to feel sorry for them. The, the ones that go home and away every week before pre-COVID, who literally spend all their money, all their time going to see... Like you, I feel so sorry for those guys because they are Chelsea through and through, City through and through, United, etc. And, I mean, I, I, just, I just don't get it. I don't get it. Why? I, I, at the best of times, find big games very exciting. Manchester City versus Spurs in the Champions League the other, a couple of years ago with that amazing Champions League um, yeah. two legs, especially the second leg. Real Madrid, sorry, Barcelona versus Liverpool. Semi-far. Fantastic. But I don't want to see it every week in like this sort of SPL, Scottish Premier League, 12 teams or 15 teams where they play each other two or three times a season. And we haven't even gotten to the point here. There's no promotion there's no relegation. There's no jeopardy. So either the games are going to be extremely dull and tedious or the games are going to be really good because there's no consequences. What sort of fun is that? Kylian Mbappe and Phil Foden and uh, uh, Erling Haaland, three of the most p- biggest potential youngsters we have in the whole world of football. Why? In the almost the peak of their career where they can go on to do unbelievable things. Would they want to play in games that have no consequences long term, I don't know what. And this whole thing about, oh, you know, you know they're not going to let him play for the uh, international team. I know this is all hearsay because it's not happening anymore. But even so, it's it's worth pointing out. Imagine an England side. We're going to have like James Tarkovsky at the back. No, thank you. I want. I, albeit John Stones had a terrible, terrible game yet last night. Um, I'd want to see Harry Maguire. Yeah. Um, Joe Gomez, if he wasn't injured, but but uh, this England team that we have and the potential that England have to have seventy percent of it wiped away, 
our best player would be Jack Grealish and James Madison. Of course, he wouldn't play because Southgate doesn't rate him because of the whole COVID thing a couple of weeks ago. It's just very, very disappointing to see. And the players were fantastic in coming out and doing what they did, which is going against it. Starting with a player that I don't really like, but I've given him immense credit now, Patrick Bamford. Yeah, completely. I don't know why they didn't consult with the players first. I read that they found out. By, I don't know what they thought the players were going to were going to do because if the players don't want to play, there's no Super League. Mm. So I think that was a baffling strategy and it didn't work. Yeah. Um, and the actual format, as you're saying, of the league also doesn't work if there's no if there's no glory and there's no you know sadness if you go down if there's no risk then who cares if you come second in the Super League compared to first? Well, well, it was it was a it wasn't it a top eight going to a quarter final? Yeah, it's, and there's it's, like you got you'll go out, but even so, you're in it next season. It's 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 really bizarre. It's really bizarre. And then the guest teams are the only ones that can swap around. It just makes no sense. Patrick Bamford, I'm glad you came on to him because I was going to come on to him as well. One thing he said really resonated with me. Go on. Where was this energy from UEFA yes. when players were getting racially abused mm. and things like this were happening? It was absolutely nowhere to be seen. A 10-match ban for the Slavia Prague player who racially abused Glenn Kamara. 10-match ban. Trippier got 12 matches for some betting um, issues that he had when he moved to Atletico Madrid. He, it's, he basically it's told farce. his mate. He told yeah. his mate he was joining Atletico Madrid, which is fantastic. And obviously, <laughs> obviously, he can't do that. I mean, obviously, fair play to him. <laughs> but that got a 12 yeah. game ban. Someone was li- literally racist in front of the referees. They looked back on the evidence. They found him guilty for it. It wasn't just an accusation, and they thought. 10 games is sufficient. He shouldn't be playing football again, as far as I'm concerned. I think that if you're racist, that is an unbelievably bad offence and it shouldn't be in today's game at all. And for UEFA to come out and give out bans like that, that are so minuscule, that are so minute, he's playing in the Europa League next season unless bloody Stavio Prague get brought into the new Super League when Perez just shits himself again and makes a new plan. But... It's just, it makes no sense to me. And Patrick Bamford, I'm glad he called that out because mm. UEFA were very quick to come in the support of English football and European football even when their pockets were going to get hurt by it. But when it's an actual reason, uh, an actual issue in society such as racism, they were absolutely nowhere to be seen and it shouldn't be forgotten. I must uh, mention this is going to be the first video we make which will be unmonetized because we're allowed to swear. Well, not allowed to, but we can't because let's just let the shackles off because um, I, I can't believe it. I can't believe that a player who, in the most pussiest way, I don't even know if that's a word, I don't care. He went up to him and he went like that and like said what he said, yeah. ran away or walked away. I've seen the like, disgusting. And Glenn Kamara's like, hey, 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 he's just said whatever. He's just said that. Fucking oh, and Glenn pussy. Kamara, Glenn Kamara, then getting got a three-match ban. ban. Oh, don't it's, get me it's started. It's unbelievable because because that is, it's almost saying, okay, look, we know he's been racist to you. We know he's really offended you and said something awful, but then you reacted. Why are you reacting? So we're going to give you a ban that's almost a third of his length, and it's like that they shouldn't be comparable no. at all. No. I mean, I don't know what Kamara actually did in the reaction. I think it was down the tunnel, um, possibly almost like a, a small assault or something like that, something physical. I don't think it was anything too outrageous compared to what happened to him. But, even but so. obviously, you know, within the rules, there's probably had to be some sort of punishment. I, I completely get that. You're, you know, you can't hit someone if that's what he did. But to even have it within the same... Um, to, even, to even have it as a comparable punishment is, is, a, is a farce. Uh, and, and I tell you what, the the message of say no to racism very much was overshadowed by the ESL and it has to be implemented. It has to, I mean, players are still taking the knee. Fantastic. I remember going to the Fulham Liverpool game and took the knee, round of applause. I, I just, it was very emotional, very like uplifting. And look, I think there are so many issues with football at the moment. And it really took us this week to realise that football is so fucked. It's so fucked. Um, 
I, I just, I, it's sad. It's so sad that uh, six people, six families think they can just arrogantly take the history of the game, the English game, literally in the 70s and the 80s with Nottingham Forest and Aston Villa winning the Euro European Cup. Oh, no, no, no. We're top six. We've had an Amazon documentary. Uh, we've got this brand new stadium, which is also an NFL stadium. We haven't won a trophy, but but of course we had Mourinho. We've got one of the best strikers in the world in Gareth Bale. Uh, Daniel Levy. Daniel Levy thinks that Spurs could be in a European Super League. Spurs, who are playing a European, not European, playing a Carabao Cup final this weekend. I hope they get smashed. I hope they get absolutely smashed and Phil Foden runs rings and has a hat trick. Um, got to say that you make a great point there because one of the things, the, the, the main reasons why everyone was so upset by this is if you support a club the size of Fulham, one of the things that brings you the most joy is something unexpected. Mm. It's that Europa League run. It's mm. getting into Europe when you're not expected to. And this Super League killed the dreams of every other club that wasn't in the Super League. It also killed the dream of the Super League teams because you're not going to be winning a, a Champions League or a Premier League again most likely in normal circumstances. It doesn't feel the same. It doesn't feel real. It doesn't feel like an achievement mm. when you're getting billions of pounds in and you know that you've got the best squad in the world. The English game is one of these leagues where a story like Leicester can happen. Mm. Someone like Leicester can come out from nowhere. They nearly go down. The next year they win the league and absolutely no one expected it. And it was an amazing story. And things like that happening is what drove this Super League. I know the Juventus... Someone on the Aventus board was very angry that Leicester won the league because he thought that it was embarrassing. He thought that it took away the shine of the traditionally great clubs. And this is why it was so important that we defeated this because as a Fulham fan, one of the things that's giving me hope in football is the fact that one day we could be one of the best teams. Mm. We, of course we could. It takes a few years to turn it around and obviously a longer time for a more sustainable, um, big club. But it's possible, of course, it is. anyone can do it. If you're in League Two right now, you know that technically in three years' time, you could be in the Premier League. You could be fighting against Man City. You could be fighting against Chelsea. And it's that hope that keeps everyone going. And it's why everyone is in love with football. And they tried to take that away. And I'm so relieved that it got shut down because even though I've seen the calls for the Premier League, what it would look like without the top six, I think it looks like a load of fun. Anyone could win it. Anyone it could go great. down. And that's brilliant. Um, is it sustainable in terms of TV rights and things like that? That I'm not so sure um, mm. in terms of the product that the Premier League is. And that's sadly just the sad way that the game has gone and one of the reasons that I think it needs to change. But one thing's for sure, winning the Premier League or having an achievement like that with the top six in it is going to be a lot better than without. And like it or not, the, top, the big six are the richest six They've won the most recently or even, well, some of them have, some of them haven't. Um, mm. But it, uh, this achievement's going to feel, if we make an achievement now, it's going to feel a hell of a lot better that we got one over these very corrupt owners that just do not get it. Completely, completely correct. Um, what I will say is that 20, so basically what was basically rumoured or, or everyone was getting excited about was the top six would leave the Premier League and go down to the National Conference Vanarama National League, which I would be all for, by the way. Absolutely brilliant. And you'd be left with no relegation this season. And then the top six teams in the championship would basically go into the Premier League. And with Reading drawing last night to Luton, it looked like it would have been Norwich, Watford, Swansea, Brentford, ugh, uh, Bournemouth and Barnsley. Fantastic. Um and I tell you what, what I would, what we would have seen is full stadiums every week, no matter what, because everyone would be like, right, let's go to these games, let's get behind the team, because we could genuinely finish top four, you know. You, you, uh, and, and then, and then it comes in like, oh, if you got promoted, how much money would you be given? I mean, it'd be very complicated, um, but it would have been a hell of an exciting thing. I mean, I, 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 I mean, I predicted, I said on the group chat, we'd finish fifteenth out of those twenty teams. <laughs> Just because, I, I don't know, knowing Fulham and what they do sometimes. But, I mean, if we genuinely invested, kept Jalkim Anderson and, and Ariel and built a team around the spine, you know, there's no reason why we couldn't finish top seven. Um, just just 
improving. Uh, and, and then also to say, your point fantastically, Leicester were in the championship, bouncing around playoffs, finally got promoted, won the championship in 2013-14 when we went down. Um, they then miraculously stayed up on the last day of the season. And then the next season, won the Premier League under Claudio Ranieri, who, of course, was awful for us. Uh, when the Champions League got to the quarterfinals, lost to Atletico Madrid, heartbreaking. Leeds United have been in League One and bouncing around the championship for 16 years. League One, Championship, McCormack, all those players. They're up. They're going to stay up this season. They're fantastic. And if Bielsa can get some decent players in, because I think that Leeds United squad is... I mean, they've done well this season. They've done fantastically well. But they could do better with a bit of Premier League money. I would expect to see Leeds in the top four in the next three years. I mean, if they keep Bielsa and this yeah. very, very chaotic style of play... Um, and that is the dream of a. That is that is it. I mean, we we came seventh in 09, 08, 09 after just staying up on oh seven oh eight, and we got to the European final against Atletico Madrid, uh, and then we got into Europe again. And because the Odense player decided to put the ball one yard closer with the free kick, we went out the Europa League in the group stages, and that to this day still lives up here. Um, and look. To be back in Europe one day again would be utterly amazing. I could you just imagine those three away games in the Europa League um, group stages and then hopefully getting through into the knockouts. Uh, and I really hope the 14 bully, bully the top six now. Like literally just, I know it's going to be difficult. And if, if, it's not, if they're not sanctioned well enough, then they're just going to get away with it and keep on winning the league. But I really, really now hope we're seeing West Ham, Leicester, Leeds, Wolves, Everton pile them and just get two out of those four places at least and just get the likes of Arsenal gone, Tottenham gone, Chelsea nowhere near Europe uh, because it would be wonderful to see because I think that's what football karma should do to these top six. Hope so. I really hope so. I hope that this year West Ham get into the Champions League. I would love to mm. see it. Um instead of a team that's been there and done it before recently. Um, I like to see stories. I like to see the underdog pull through. Obviously, that can't always happen. I'm fully aware of that. But, you know, this is what football's about. It's about the underdog pulling through. It's about going on, going, going to a game and knowing that no matter what the gulf is between the two sides, at the end of the day, it's literally just, to, you know, it's 11 men on the pitch versus 11 men on the pitch. If someone has a bad day, it doesn't matter if they're messy they have a bad day and this is what the super league didn't get this is why i compared it to that um to the advert before where it was perfect football it's the the advert they use on their the slogan i mean um on their website was the best games the best players every week and you know that that's not what football's about that's unrealistic no if it's the best games every week they're not the best games anymore games yeah they are just games. They are, they, are, they, are, they are meanless. They are not special. If you're an Arsenal fan, of course you want to play Barcelona. Do you want to play Barcelona twice a year, every year, just because you have to? No. You want to earn the right to play them in the mm. Champions League, in the final. You want to beat them unexpectedly, that sort of thing. And this is just not what that was. Uh, can I ask you a question? Go on. In pre-season, when you have that four mini league tournament, when it's like Inter Milan, Spurs... Uh, uh, I don't know, uh, uh, City and Roma. Would you watch them, friendlies? Absolutely not. Oh, just boring, aren't they? It's exactly the same. It's exactly the same. Yeah, that is it. That would be it. It's, it's a friendly. They're just all friendlies, basically. Uh, and brilliant. also, one point we haven't said, by the way, is if it's all money-driven, I don't think they'd have been held in um, in England for long. I think they'd have moved the games eventually to somewhere far, far richer, you know, you know, you go to China or somewhere and mm. make, make the money there. Their stadiums would still be completely full mm. and it would be fans, but it mm. wouldn't be, um, it wouldn't be the, the fans here. It'd be horrible. I, I was actually, I was going to mention this earlier. I completely forgot. Imagine you've got Manchester United, this Manchester United. Imagine if they got Fulham away on Saturday, 12.30 kickoff. They then got, Real Madrid on the Tuesday night in Dubai. And then they've got the Saturday lunchtime kickoff 
away at Bournemouth. Yeah. What like what what kind of world it's is bonkers. that? It's bonkers. Yeah. It's madness. Um, the Earn It t-shirts, fantastic. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. And Leeds United drawing to Liverpool was was fantastic. Great night. Um, uh, Liverpool were, didn't play very well. They played well in the first half, didn't play well in the second half. Uh, Southampton should have maybe got something from the game last night. But these top six clubs, I mean, they've literally demonstrated it in the last few days. Arsenal drawing with us, not good enough. They're not good enough for this this elitism, this elite league. There shouldn't be an elite league because anyone can beat anyone. Real Madrid have lost their fair share of games this season. Barcelona, the same. Atletico Madrid, the same. Arsenal, the same. I mean, Arsenal had a terrible season. Um, why they think they have this self-entitlement is utterly bonkers. Joe? I, I remember I read... Um someone complaining it was someone related to arsenal saying oh, i'm sick of playing against teams like burnley burnley have taken four points off you this season they're probably the same you know mm. that's actually the easiest on the eye and i know that i don't want to mock any fans any real fans of these clubs because it's not their fault it's not them making these decisions i don't want to even mock the players or the managers even if i don't like some of them because it's nothing to do with them their performances on the pitch couldn't have change this in fact i actually think that because these clubs some of them are doing more poorly that has accelerated the the mm. need in this leone's eyes for this super league because they're thinking what a waste of time being mid-table in the premier league is we might not get into europe next season mm. um we might not get into europe for a few seasons and it's like well we, we, we're one of the richest clubs in the league mm. let's go and make our own league and play them every week mm. uh, where's the big money at it's the big games oh, we can't get into Champions League because we're not good enough. You know what? Let's just go and do our own league so we can play them every week and generate that money. Uh, Joe, on Sunday, we saw probably the most selfish act and inept thing you'll ever see uh, in football. Uh, I'm not talking about the European Super League. I'm talking about Ruben Loftus cheek <laughs> I, I knew you were going to be talking about this. I just, oh my gosh. I'm sorry. We have to talk about it. I mean, we haven't talked about Fulham yeah. at all. But I'm sorry, I, I remember I was going to open with that, but I completely forgot. Yeah. Um, Ruben Loftus Cheek came on with 15 to 20, 20 to 15, whatever, 20 minutes ago. Why that chance in added time where he had the ball and just run, just run down the line, try and see it in the corner? We haven't done that at all this season, by the way, streetwise seeing the game out into the corner. I, I genuinely can't remember the last time we did that. I remember Chelsea doing it against us with five minutes to go when they're one up when we had 10 men. Very odd. Um, Ruben Loftus cheek miscontrolled the ball so many times, gave away a throw, which then led to their two corners, which Matt Ryan won a header and Eddie Nketiah scored. I mean, we can't... I mean, we have to talk about it, don't we? Eddie Nketiah. For me, I am I am so annoyed by what Loftus cheek did, by the way. I thought he was just almost like careless. Just, oh, he let the ball go out just kick it up the line or something or run down the line or anything to oh, kill weird. it at a time because we were just penned in. What I actually think is more unforgivable is the fact that Matt Ryan, one of the smallest goalkeepers I've ever seen, <laughs> won a header in our box in the 96th minute. That personally annoys me more because mm. I'm thinking, we, we need this. Arsenal don't need this. This almost dwarf goalkeeper doesn't need this. <laughs> Fucking head it away. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? It really annoyed me because that shouldn't have happened. <laughs> And we could get into we could get into the goal. Should it have been allowed? Should it have not been allowed? I don't think it was really interfering. He wasn't in offside position, but Ariola was going to dive anyway because the shot was coming in. I think it would have been harsh, personally. But on the balance of ones we've seen this season, I also wouldn't have been surprised if it had got disallowed. Mm. Um, it's really annoying because a win would have almost put us straight back in the mix. We'd have mm. been, I believe, four points off Burnley oh. with them to play. Um, obviously you win that game and regardless of other results it's a one point gap which is minuscule at this stage of the season and it's a real shame because I thought we defended brilliantly for the entire game um, actually other than the first minute of the game where we were awful um, oh yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah that was absolutely Nelly. terrible I, I thought that was in um, mm. but yeah it should, it shouldn't. We, we should of course talk a tiny bit about Fulham before the end I thought we played well we offered absolutely nothing going forward um, throughout the whole game um, which is, again, a disappointing thing. But at least we actually managed to score 
Um, normally the problem this season is we have created stuff, but we haven't scored. On Sunday we created nothing and we did mm. score. Yeah, but what was worrying about that is, yeah, we created nothing. We did score, but that wasn't from open play. We scored a penalty. It wasn't, no. It wasn't, and, no. And, and that really did worry me because even, even in our preview last week, our SW6 Central last week, we said on expansive pitch against a very against an Arsenal team who don't defend well at times, we can get at them. And we really didn't create at all. And that's worrying for me. I, I think it was criminal that we didn't go for a second goal at the end when they were pushing on because there was... We had one break where Loftus Cheek got into the box and he pulled it back and it didn't quite make it. It wasn't his worst moment in the game. Yeah, I thought yeah, he did yeah. quite well to get into that position. Um, the final ball was just lacking. But we didn't do that enough because at the end of the game, it was almost, we just completely invited them on. And I know that that happens with the momentum in football games. But at the same time, they knew that they could put all 10 men, 11 men even, in added time in our box. There was a minute of added time left and Matt Ryan was in our box. I mean, that just shows you, doesn't it? We, we clear that ball, there's an open goal at the other end. It was the same mm. as Leicester away, where we mm. nearly scored. Um, but there was no intent to go for the second goal. And I understand why we've been let down so many times by let, late goals lately. It was almost like, why take any risks? But at the same time, with seven minutes added on at the end, you've just got to kill time. You've got to go down the other end of the pitch. You've just got to keep it there. They can't score if it's down there. And that was what was so gutting. And also Nketiah, who I think is a very poor forward. I don't rate him at all. I think he's crap. For him to score, shush the imaginary crowd that wasn't there. Even if that it was, was there, by the way, that was that's a home end. Just in case you didn't know that, because I guess he wasn't involved much when there were crowds. That is a home end. He's winking. I don't know who he's winking at. It better not be me, because I had a dream that he equalised a few days earlier <laughs> in added time, which I, I mentioned to you. But yeah, frustrating, but obviously ended up not being the biggest news of the day. No. And that was that was almost, I, and this is the season. It's been, I like to call it, you know that chant, Ma uh, mauled by the Tigers. Yeah. My whole city, I always say, mauled by false hope. Um, uh, because I got my hopes up thinking that the top six are going to get just go from the Premier League and we're going to stay up. Um, <laughs> which is naive, obviously, but it's just, I've got my Fulham hat on. Um, and when I've got my Fulham hat on, I'm very tunnel visioned and I don't really see the bigger picture. Um, yeah, I, I, it was bizarre, wasn't it? I just so many chances that Arsenal had the Ariola save, the they went around the keeper, they still missed the chance. Uh, I just thought that this is under the VAR goal, which got disallowed, and the penalty that was given to us, and the onside and the marginalized. I was like, this, this is definitely going to be three points. So I was so shocked when they scored. Because everything was going our way. And, um, and because we came to this game and I kind of watched it like, sat back like this thinking, if we lose, we're down. And if we win, no. we're still... And, and then again, you're mauled by false hope because you take the lead and suddenly you're like seven minutes out of time. I was sitting right there, like right in front of the TV, just completely like praying we get through this. And then of course we get let down again, like Wolves, like any other time in the season. And that is going to be probably the end of the uh, the end of the, the the episode. And we've been speaking for almost an hour, which is our yeah. longest ever episode. It's almost like a live stream sort of thing, uh, just because we knew that we we're going to go big on the European Super League. Yeah, one hundred percent. I mean, it's one of the biggest issues that we've had in football for a long time, um, and it's gonna it's gonna change a lot of things. I'm hoping that one thing it leads to is is a few of these very dodgy owners stepping down and just getting out of the game because they don't care. Final question. Go on. I saw on Twitter today, Josh Madger, does he score a lot of goals in the championship for Fulham next season? And would you, so then would you sign him? Permanently? Now, personally, personally, I would sign him. I don't think he'd be someone that would score 30 or something in the championship but I think he'd do okay I think he'd probably do better than a Kamara would as okay. like a second striker I wouldn't want to go into a championship season with him as our main option that makes sense because to be honest with you I don't think he brings an awful lot when he's not scoring I think his all-round game has got a lot to be worked on but finishing wise I think he's very good the penalty was clinical two goals at Everton in the right place and the goal that he scored against Spurs which should have counted ideally Mm. Um, was a great finish against a very good goalkeeper in Maurice. 
And so if, if, if you include that goal, I know it didn't count. Let's just say he's got four so far, a really emphatic penalty, two poachers goals and a great finish. Then he's, he's, he's done all right, considering that he's only been here since, since the start of February. Um, so in answer to your question, I would definitely sign him uh, as long as the fee's not too mental. I don't think it is. I think it was only up to about 10 million, which in today's football um, is not much. And that's that's part of the problem is 10 million is a lot of money. Um, mm. But in the championship, I think he'd do a, a decent job. Yes. What do you think? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was convinced by that tweet. I can't remember who tweeted it now. They said, by the way, Josh Magic gets 15 plus goals in the championship. And I thought, actually, you know what? Didn't really think of that. I mean, if we went down, I mean, you put it in the chat literally before we started. Daryl DK from uh, Barnsley. I'd love him, but I think Barnsley fans love him. And I, I think he's on loan as well. So um, I'm, I'm not really sure. But but Josh Madge is a great option with Mitrovic if Mitrovic stays. Of course, we shouldn't yeah. really be talking about this because Coventry is staying up, which means Fulham are staying up because Coventry <laughs> haven't played Fulham in 54 years in the league. Uh, but all being said, if, if we do go down and we play Coventry, Rico Arena next season will be the standout away. I'd be the one that I'm looking forward to the most on the fixture list. And hopefully we don't get it midweek and we get it in the sun in August or in April or in May. Joe Sanson, we've hit the hour mark. Uh, what a marathon. And I hope people have stayed with us. If they have, then thank you so much because I tell you what, it's been an interesting one. Yeah, I've really enjoyed this debate and talking about the Super League. Um, hopefully it's the last time we have to talk about it ever again, to be honest with you. Or hopefully not, so that the top six can just go and we can focus on what will be an amazing Premier League season. Playing Oak, playing Oakwell next season in the Premier League, I think is my all-time dream. Yeah, fingers Honestly. crossed. It could happen. We can still stay up. It shouldn't be forgotten. We can. It's unlikely, mm. but we can. Yeah. So we just have to hope they give everything like they gave at Arsenal because defensively, I thought. It looked like they were giving their absolute all to keep a clean sheet and they looked as determined as I've seen them all season. One thing didn't fall our way, everything else did and then that sadly cost us. But if we can play like that at Chelsea, hopefully we can get something. Yep, you said the C word um, and that really is going to be no monetization for this video. Uh, we're going to be previewing, uh, uh, I suppose we're going to be doing an SW6 Central talking about the Chelsea game next week. Um, uh, I said the C word, that's awful. Um and and yeah, we'll see you then. We're playing them on Saturday at 5.30, live on Sky Sports. And uh, let's get it ready. Joe Sanson, thanks very much for being here. Thanks a lot, Jack. Thanks for watching, guys. Yep. Uh, enjoy your dinner. Enjoy your time. Um, and come on, Fulham. Fulham. <laughs>